Thanks for the introduction, John. Um, so my name is Wo Titano. Um, today I'll be talking about IFP, which is a kinetic uh, vlasov fokker planck code, which is being designed to simulate uh, ICF uh, implosion, inertial confinement fusion capsule implosions um, fully implicitly. Uh, my collaborators includes my two mentors, uh, Luis Chacon, which is uh, in the audience, and Andrei Simakov. Uh, the funding source for this project is coming out of the Metropolis Postdoc Fellowship Program and the Thermonuclear uh, Burn Initiative. So in this talk, I'll uh, quickly go through some of the motivations, application side motivations, and the development of the code and um, <clears throat> the related challenges in solving the vlasov fokker planck equation. Then I'll dive into the uh, enabling technologies, that ha solver technologies that we had to uh, develop in order to um, solve the system of equation. At the, and at the end, I'll quickly um, summarize and give some future focuses on the project. So for those who are not familiar with the inertial confinement fusion concept, at least the laser-based ICF concept, how it works is that you have a capsule, typically a plastic, with the typically deuterium and tritium, you blast it and then the surface forms a coronal plasma which will electrostatically blow off. And then the inward rocket force compressing the capsule and the fuel. And once the capsule reaches a uh, high enough temperature and density, then you start getting a uh, fusion reaction. So that's kind of the uh, basic idea of how ICF works. So why are we developing uh, this capability? Well, in short, it's because we think that kinetic effects could be important in uh, ICF calculations. So what you see here in the figure is basically uh, yield over clean, which is basically the ratio between the neutron uh, yield observed from experiment over uh, 1D clean hydrodynamic calculation as a function of Knudsen number, which is basically a characteristic dimensionless number that tells you, gives you how important kinetic effects are. So basically, if the Knudsen number is very small, then you're in the hydrodynamic regime, and existing hydrodynamic codes should be sufficient and valid in describing your experiments. If it's high or if it's not small enough, then it means that kinetic effects are important and hydrodynamic assumptions breaks down. So it turns out in uh, ICF um, experiments, uh, specifically in national ignition uh, facility conditions, there are actually scenarios where the Knudsen number is large enough. So people have been uh, using hydrodynamic codes to uh, predict and design these capsules, and they're seeing that they're not being able to get ignition. So we think that uh, perhaps kinetic effects should, uh, could be playing an important role, and that's why we're developing uh, vlasov fokker planck capability. So uh, the system of equations that we're, uh, that, uh, we're dealing with is the vlasov fokker planck equation, uh, shown in this equation, the uh, middle part is just a classic Vlasov term. And on the right hand side is the collision operator. And basically this equation will describe the time evolution of the plasma distribution function on a uh, position, velocity, phase space. The Fokker-Planck operator can be casted in a uh, generalized tensor diffusion advection equation where the diffu tensor diffusion and the advection uh, velocity space coefficients could be evaluated as a Hessian and gradient of what's called the Rosenbluth potentials, G and H, which are in turn obtained by solving a uh, couple Poisson equations. So I, I do want to stress here that what, so Fokker-Planck equation in general is an integral differential equation. This is an aspect that really makes the problem notoriously hard to solve. But we cast it into a purely differential form in the Poisson formulation so that we could hit this uh, Poisson system with a fast optimal multi-grid scheme. But in general, it's an integral differential formulation. And in the, uh, the Landau formulation, which is sort of the alternative formulation, is formally identical. So in our system, we'll also be dealing with a fluid electron with a quasi-neutrality and ambipolarity approximation. So let me just start talking about some of the challenges associated with the vlasov rosenbluth fokker planck equation. One is the time scale issue, and the other is the length scale issue, just like in any multi-scale problems. So in the length scale, there's two components, the velocity component, velocity space component, and the physical space component. In the velocity space grid, disparate temperatures during implosion of the capsule dictates your velocity space uh, resolution. So if you consider a, t a hot plasma and a cold plasma existing, coexisting in the same domain, then it's obvious that um, in order to um, 
um, in order to accommodate the hot plasma, you have to have a large enough velocity space domain. And in order to resolve the cold distribution function, you have to have a very high resolution. So if you're using a static grid, it's a bad idea for this uh, particular uh, reason. So kind of a similar argument for the physical space grid. Uh, throughout time, your capsule is imploding. And within the capsule, you have shock waves, too, which uh, the length scales are much smaller than the capsule uh, dimension. So if you want to resolve all of these length scales on a static mesh, again, it's not uh, practical. So more quantitatively, uh, how impractical is this? So let's just consider a 1D in physical uh, space and two-dimensional in velocity space. Well, you end up, so if you want to do sort of a typical ICF implosion calculation, you end up with a trillion to 10 trillion unknowns. And if you were going to use a vanilla explicit time integrator, it's going to require a billion time steps. So a billion time step for trillion unknowns, not going to happen. So the approach that we're taking is uh, a fully implicit approach with the adaptive grid. So in the velocity space, we'll be using what's called a, um, a V-thermal based normalization adaptive grid. And in the physical space, we'll be employing a Lagrangian mesh. So together, uh, two technology will allow us to reduce the number of unknowns from a trillion to a million. And for the solver, for the time integration part, we'll be using a multi-grid preconditioned uh, nonlinearly implicit solver, spe specifically a JFNK, which will allow us to cut down the time step, number of time steps from order of billion to a couple of thousand. So a couple of thousand time step on million unknowns, I'm sure people routinely do that. So that's the approach that we're taking. So the implicit solver strategy is using a preconditioned JFNK solver. I'm sure that all the audiences are pretty familiar with JFNK, so I'm not going to go into the details. But we will be employing a left preconditioning strategy with, where the preconditioner for the, um, the, the collision operator part will be uh, block diagonalized by lagging the coefficients, the transport coefficients from the previous uh, nonlinear um, iteration. And all of these are done uh, matrix-free. So the preconditioner is effective in reducing the cryolab duration for uh, our problem. So I've chosen a test two species thermal equilibration problem where the dynamical time scale of the problem is in terms of normalized time, st time step sizes 0.5. And what you see is that uh, even if you step over this dynamical time scale, which is not a good idea for physics purpose, but just for numerical uh, performance uh, purpose I just put here, uh, the number of total number of Krylov iteration for a given uh, time uh, is bounded by 9. And it, compared to a time step size, three orders of magnitude smaller, it only increases by a factor of 3. And you can really see why we want to go to uh, the implicit um, integration scheme. Because here on the far right column, you see the ratio of the time step size that we're taking with respect to the explicit uh, constraint. And we're able to step over five orders of magnitude uh, with respect to the explicit time step sizes. Additionally, the implicit solver performance is optimal. So here you're seeing the CPU time versus number of unknowns. Open circle denotes the performance of our code. The solid line denotes the optimal order end scaling. And you see that for a large enough problem size that our solver asymptotes the uh, um, optimal scaling. And you also see a huge gain uh, compared to uh, the explicit time integration scheme. So switching gears just a little bit, um, I want to talk about um, an important um, topic for our system, which is um, the conservation properties. So in the continuum and physically, our system of equations supports a formal conservation uh, theorem for mass, momentum, and energy. And if you don't respect these guys in the discrete, you might end up uh, with an unphysical solution. So just to remind you, this is sort of the simplified uh, or abstracted uh, collision operator formulation, where J is just the collisional velocity space um, uh, flux, essentially. This is the diffusion flux, and that's the advection flux. So mass conservation can be uh, ensured straightforwardly. So if you take the zeroth uh, velocity space moment of the collision operator, since the collision operator is in divergence form, you could trivially enforce this mass conservation by setting the flux at the velocity space boundary to be equal to zero. Momentum is a bit tricky, trickier, but you basically take a first moment of the collision operator to get this symmetry, and for energy, the second moment. So in the continuum, all of these conservation properties hold exactly. But in the discrete, it's not the case. So 
due to discretization, for example, for illustration purpose, uh, the energy conservation symmetry is only ensured down to some order truncation error. So how we clean up this truncation error in the conservation property is that we introduce a discrete nonlinear constraint uh, coefficient. Um, if you wish, call it a Lagrange multiplier. But you basically modify the diffusion flux in this case by throwing in, in this gamma here and define this gamma as some uh, one plus some order truncation term and basically modify the collision operator to, that will ensure this discrete constraint here. And uh, this definition for the gamma comes straight out of the continuum symmetry definition that you're trying to enforce, so it's well defined. If you wanted to do simultaneous mass momentum and energy conservation, you could extend the same concept. It's just that now you have two uh, constraints. So you have momentum and energy, so you just can't use a single scalar. So you throw in this uh, dyad, which will be in, uh, defined in terms of two uh, scalars, one which will be the energy conserving coefficient and the other one will be the momentum conserving coefficient. And definition of these guys are also derivable from the continuum uh, constraint. It looks pretty involved, but the bottom line is that there's a very clean way of defining these guys. So now I'm going to demonstrate to you guys how important the uh, conservation properties are. So the toy problem here that I chose is an initial random distribution function case, which in time will eventually asymptote to the, uh, will converge to a equilibrium Maxwellian distribution function. That's the beauty, well, that's kind of the, one of the property of the collision operator is that it drives your uh, initial uh, distribution function to a Maxwellian. Here I'm showing you how the conservation property inf uh, improves with the nonlinear convergence tolerance epsilon sub r for the mass, momentum, and energy. Since these discrete nonlinear constraints are indeed nonlinear, your conservation properties will only be enforced down to whatever convergence tolerance you uh, enforce your system to. But you see that the conservation property improves with a, a tighter uh, convergence tolerance. And right here in the bottom right is just sort of a bonus plot, it just shows the entropy increase as a function of time. So um, if your solution starts from a non-equilibrium, then your entropy will increase until you reach that equilibrium maximum. And once it hits that equilibrium, it will just stay flat. And that's what we see, so it's a good confirmation. So um, this plot, this example here, demonstrates how important conservation properties are. Here we consider electron proton, proton thermalization case. On the left-hand side, you have all conservation, discrete conservation properties ensured. So we get a good agreement with the analytical solution, which is the circle uh, points, and we also get the correct equilibrium. If you don't have conservation property, I mean, you can see that the, uh, your simulation will basically just diverge out to equilibrium. So even if you're able to solve your problem for a given time step efficiently, if you don't uh, enforce these physical constraints, then your, your uh, your results will be garbage, essentially. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and now talk about how we deal with the uh, velocity space adaptivity. So without showing you guys any equations, I want to first uh, show you guys how it kind of works uh, in a cartoon fashion. So the left-hand side is the uh, naive static mesh, and the right-hand side is this adaptive mesh technology that uh, we developed uh, based on the thermal velocity normalization of the velocity space. So we know that the plasmas, as it gets hot, the distribution function will get wider and wider. And if it gets cold, then it gets narrower and narrower. So the basic idea is, well, if the plasma is heating, you expand it. If it's getting colder, you contract it. And for the Lagrangian mesh, we know that the capsule will be physically actually imploding, so we're just going to implode the mesh with it. That's kind of the zeroth order view of how the adaptive grid uh, te technology uh, works. So to have grid adaptivity, how do we actually do it? Well, we're going to uh, actually modify the, uh, the equation, the Vlasov-Fokker-Planck equation. So I'm just going to remind you that we are working in one-dimensional, spherically symmetric uh, physical space and a two-dimensional cylindrical geometry in the velocity space where we do this, we adopt the v-parallel, v-perp decomposition where the v-parallel velocity component is parallel to the radial axis and v-perpendicular is perpendicular to it. So we perform a coordinate transformation, normalize the velocity space coordinate in terms of the thermal velocity and then out comes all the Jacobian of the transformation which we use to then transform the equation into this ugly mess here. 
But uh, the, the, the details here are not important, and I just want you to focus your attention on these three terms here. The first term, the r dot, is basically the grid speed in your physical space. It basically arises from as an inertial term due to the fact that your grids are actually moving. And the v dot parallel and v dot perpendicular is essentially the effective acceleration term, effective acceleration of your plasmas in this normalized velocity space grid. So due to the grid adaptivity, the expanding and contracting grid, you introduce these additional uh, fictitious acceleration term, if you wish. So similar to the collision operator, so, so that kind of all set up the, the <clears throat> so that sets up the talk for the next uh, component, which is the conservation property for the Vlasov operator. So similar to the collision operator, the Vlasov operator also um, supports formal conservation properties, even under the presence of these inertial terms. So I'm just going to simplify the system to the bare bone minimum. No collision operator, no spatial dependence, just a 0 to 2v temporal uh, dependent system. Here, um, you can show that mass conservation is purely enforced by the fact that the initial term has its divergence form. So if you take the zero moment, you could ensure momentum uh, mass conservation trivially. For energy conservation, it turns out that it's going to be a bit tricky. Uh, it's going to be so you want to first rewrite that original expression you had in the previous slide in this form, and then velocity space moment. And you could actually, show, in, indeed, this uh, equation here will support more, uh, energy conservation. But what's required in the continuum is, is that the energy moment of this yellow highlighted term evaluates zero. So similar to energy conservation, we know that this is only ensured down to some truncation error. We're going to slap in this gamma and define it in such a way that in the discrete, this constraint is force. So you could do the same thing with uh, momentum, simultaneous mass momentum and energy conservation. It just turns out that it's going to be a little more complicated and involved. So for additional momentum conservation, you add this uh, psi term, which is also a truncation error term. What it does is it, in the discrete, ensures that the chain rule is actually uh, enforced. So the expression for it is very ugly, but the bottom line is that there is a well-defined uh, way of evaluating these um, uh, nonlinear constraint coefficients. So how important is it to enforce these uh, conservation constraints for the Vlasov component? Well, it turns out that it's pretty important. So here we're enforcing conservation properties for the collision operator, but not for the Vlasov term with all these additional inertial terms. So we start out our simulation with a hyperbolic tangent perturbation on the plasma. Let it go, and if you wait long enough, analytically, you know that your solution will basically equilibrate to this black solid line. But if you don't ensure these conservation properties, you get this solid black line, which is offset from the analytical solution. Well, if you look at the conservation property, at the end of the time, you're incurring 50% energy conservation error due to these uh, grid adaptivity schemes. So if you enforce these conservation symmetries, you could actually get your con energy conservation down to 10 to the negative 4. In this case, I uh, use the nonlinear convergence tolerance of 10 to the negative 4. So it corresponds with that level. But we get the exact equilibrium. So there's one more issue with uh, length scales. And uh, sure, I have two minutes. But, uh -huh, sure, sure, sure. Yep. Suppose you had a much bigger computer. Yeah, yeah. And you use constant time steps. Uh huh. Uh huh. Would the effects of losing conservation, <coughs> losing conservation, mm -hmm. be diminished? Uh huh. So, so I only showed the temporal aspect of it, but there's also the spatial aspect that you have to ensure all these conservation properties too. So, yes, you could eliminate the time, the error incurred by the, by the temporal aspect. For sure, but of course, if you have an infinitely large machine, then you could just grid the crap out of everything, and that's right. That's right. That's right. We, we, we will never be able to afford a resolution. Okay. So you know, in as as that in a number result case, you're done. Now here is just really catastrophic. Oh. And in the previous example, it was really catastrophic too. Yeah. So you made the case, um, and okay, I, I understand. Okay. All right. 
I only have a few more slides, so let me just uh, finish this up. So there's this additional length scale uh, issue that you have to deal with when you have multiple species. So with one species, so, so all the discussion I had for the Vlasov term was all for uh, interspecies. species. Now, if you have two species, for example, if you have one species that's very hot, distribution function and another species that's very cold, very narrow distribution function. On the hot species grid, the cold species will basically show up as a delta function. There's no way that you'll ever be able to resolve that. And similarly, on the cold species, the hot species will basically appear as a sort of a constant distribution function, which physically it's not. There are gradients to that, and by evaluating the gradient of the distribution functions or the potentials, you actually get the transport coefficients. So, but in these scenarios, we basically take advantage of this um, separation of scales by performing a multiple expansion for this case, hot on cold, and Taylor series expansion on the cold on hot interaction and basically approximate the Rosenbluth potentials that goes into the evaluation of the transport coefficients. So, together with the grid adaptivity strategy and asymptotics, uh, we were able to perform this calculation of a three species thermalization problem where we have an alpha species, a deuterium species, and an electron, where the electron and deuterium starts out with a temperature of one in terms of normalized units, and the alpha species starts out with a temperature of 1700. So if you were gonna run this calculation on a static uniform grid, zero D2V, the number of unknowns is gonna be order billion, or 10 billion. But with the uh, new technology that we developed, we could cut down the number of unknowns to 128 by 64, so a mesh savings of order millions. So this is really an enabling technology that allows us to actually study ICF kinetic plasmas fully, fully kinetically. So in summary, we've developed a fully implicit optimal vlasov fokker planck solver based on a precondition, multi-grid preconditioned JFNK solver. Uh, disparate disparate interspecies um, uh, thermal velocity or disparity in space and time is handled via this adaptive grid in the velocity space. Interspecies uh, coupling is handled via asymptotics and discrete conservation is uh, enforced by satisfying uh, continuum symmetries by introducing these nonlinear constraints. So future focus, uh, we've already implemented and started testing the Lagrangian mesh, the uh, moving mesh in the physical space and also uh, spherical geometry, uh, but it hasn't been well characterized yet, so hopefully by the next time we'll have all these uh, nice character characterization. Um, we'll also want to implement radiation transport and couple it to the plasma system to be able to study some of the multi-physics aspects in ICF capsule implosion, but we'll see how far we could go. So with that, I'll take uh, questions. Thank you. Additional questions first. Yes. Sorry. You actually just moving the mesh each time step, or actually you solving the some kind of one of the governing equations that are running just as a governing, just not the whole thing. So we 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 are solving, I guess the so so. so. It's an Eulerian in the, this uh, logical grid, right? But we basically just have this moving mesh uh, feature. No, we don't do any remapping. It is a Lagrangian, right, right. It is a Lagrangian That's right. And basically, you can see this, uh, how we uh, bring into the, the moving mesh aspect is by giving the grid speed into this transform equation as an inertial term. The hydro gates, that red term cancels exactly the velocity, so that term disappears. Uh -huh. But in this case, it doesn't, because that's a. That's all right. So that's it's like a fluid motion, whereas the other velocity is a, it's a, it's an independent volume. That's right. And then I have one more question. Mm -hmm. Say so people have more slides. Ah, forward? Forward, yeah. Okay. There's a definition of gamma. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, let's see. So the gamma is, I can't see, but it's, it's related to. Right, that's right. It's a moment of the energy moment of the divergence. So this term you could show is a well defined. It doesn't go to zero. Uh, if you have zero density, then you'll have so zero particle will make this go to zero. But right, that's right. That's right. Any other questions? So your focus on Lagrangian one D in space. That's right. Mm -hmm. Multi-D in velocity spaces. 
Uh, that's correct. Uh -huh. Is this an indication that you think this issue is most important in terms of capsule implosions, in terms of the, the non max loading distribution? Right, that's right, that's and, right. That's right. And the mixing that the hydrodynamics would tend to give you that you're not getting with sort of 1D Lagrangian, that, that at least starting out, we feel this less. That's right. And even if you go to multi D, uh, you know, fluid codes. Most fluid codes simulate this as a sort of bulk single fluid hydrodynamics. So um, the only way to things to mix is through kind of this coffee right. steering, right, 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 that's right, through these Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. So uh, you don't get any atomic mixing um, in hydro codes, which kinetic codes can actually capture. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker.